Okay, welcome to lecture five. We continue our discussion on the ODB test. In particular, we will see the Friedel Sudan analysis of the line point test in the first part of today's lecture. Hopefully, we'll complete it by the end of the first part. And then we'll see how to construct PCPs based on this low degree test, just like we have constructed PCPs based on linearity testing in the second part of today's lecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was the Friedel Sudan? What was the low degree test that we were looking at last time? So let's recap. So the input is the finite field F. Is an ambient dimension M. There's a degree parameter D. These are explicit inputs. Then there's an implicit input F. You're given access to your function. This is Oracle access to this function. And we want to check if F is low degree or far from low degree. And the low degree test did the following it picked X at random from F to the M. That's a point. It picked the X H at random from also f to the m, set the line l to be x plus th, the speed ranges in f, which is a random line this form. Okay, so not only have this, it might have the access to a line oracle, f on lines to polynomials, so univariate polynomials of degree. Actually, the notation we had used last time was to read Solomon code words F of D. So, query F on X and F on L accept if. The f of L at the point X is equal to F of X. That was the low degree test. And the theorem we wanted to prove is the following statement due to Peter and Sudan. From all epsilon in zero one, there exists a C greater than zero. Such that if size of F was larger than C D and the probability that the test passes, that is F of X equals F of L, X is, is not equal to this was smaller than delta which was smaller than 1 by 8 minus epsilon or a random choice of x h. Suppose we had this, suppose the test passed with reasonable probability, then, then there exists a polynomial p in R 
let's call it lifted reed solomon that delta f and p less than two delta what is capital power is hmm? what is capital f so capital s so uh, in the in the statement of the theorem so uh, for all epsilon if F and F satisfy this, then small f is. So even if there's one line oracle for which the rejection probability is low, it tells you that the point oracle has to be close to the. That's what it's stating. And it has to be position on that. What? And so if P, uh, so when, uh, when, the placement is large enough, lifted bridge so long code is equivalent to regular code. Yes, yes. And in that case, capital F has to be a restriction on that. Yeah? I didn't follow the question. I mean, uh, suppose. So uh, let me say this, let me say this one. So, how are you planning to prove this? So, by the way, this is not how Peter Susan talked about it. Peter Susan talked about Reed Muller codes. So, there's a slide, this one. So, there's what is called Reed Muller codes, which is the evaluation of just like Reed Solomon are evaluation of univariate polynomials on the entire field is an evaluation of multivariate polynomials of degree of a particular degree say less than equal to Reed Solomon Pm over the entire field. So, so Four words here are RM, there's an underlying field, there's an ambient dimension and a degree D. That's read Muller. Then there's lifted read Solomon. There's lifted read Solomon, the ambient field, M and D. This is set of all function. What is this? It's a set of all functions on FMUF, but then for all lines, for all lines in FM, F restricted to L belongs to Reed Solomon F. Hmm? And we saw the following lemma due to Peter Susan last time that if D is less than say F is equal to psi F is a finite F is a finite field of size Q and this is equal to P bar K where P is prime so that the characteristic of the field is P and if D is less than Q minus Q by P. Hmm? Then lifted RS F M D is contained or in this case is equal to RM F. So if the, if the field is smaller than this, which is the going to be the case, which is mostly going to be the case for almost all settings of the theorem which we prove here. We will in fact have that that the, the refractory Solomon code is actually equal to the input code. So for this capital that okay to think of this as a, for every so you look at the points table and for every line the pick the best fit. Yeah, that's fit. So, yeah. So, because the, what we want to prove is if even one for one capital, if that happens, we want to prove this, we might as well assume. So, by the way, so I'm not going to prove lemma. This lemma was proved in last lecture. And that, and that, and that characterization is tight. 
in the sense that that constraint is pegged t equals q minus q by p. We saw a counter example to this. There were examples of distributed polynomial codes which were not read Muller codes. Good. I'm coming to Mrinal's question. So the the Friedel Sudan theorem is true for all. Is true for any f given a particular f, a smaller. So we one might as well work with the best fit f. That is, let's define this polynomial p of f d at l. Yes, now you're given an F. What's the best fit for it? It's the argument over all G in reach Solomon FD of delta F restricted to L. Is that fine? And if there are multiple of them, break ties are very So we might as well assume that the hypothesis of the Friedel Susan is the fact that probability over a random choice of x and h f of x equals is not equal p f h l of x is less than equal to that. We assume. This. In fact, now so we will define this quantity delta s. So let's first define it for delta f for a particular line is the probability. Then when I pick a random point on that line, f of x is not equal to p e of h l of x and delta f is the same so these are definitions of the x and x and h it should be clear that delta f is actually the expectation but what did i do just that it did not catch Fair enough. Good. Every line has an num associated number between zero and one, which is tells you how close is the restriction of the function to a reach Solomon code word on that line. That's delta F L, and delta F is the average of this one. And what we have to so put in this word, the hypothesis of the F S hypothesis is just the fact that. Delta F is less than or equal to delta. Okay. So all your edges here are really the slope of the line. All the edges are here a slope of line. So the only reason I'm going to use that you so there, there are two ways you can pick a random line, just pick a random line, or pick a random point in a random direction. It's almost the same except when. The random direction happens to be zero, all zeros, in which case it's a, it's a degenerate line. Uh, for various reasons of sampling, it would be better to work include the degenerate lines also as things among our lines. In that case, the solomon code is just constant. It's just the constant. So the test trivially passes on that line. It's going to give you a point and it best passes. Uh, 
And we are basically going to prove this by our two claims. Claim one is something we have seen all the ah, so we, firstly, given such an F, we can now define the self-correction of F. What the self-correction of F? Self-correction of a function F is we define f of corrected. This is another function from fm to f. Basically, we'll take every point, we will go over all lines that pass through this point and find and ask what is what do they predict for this point and choose the most popular value. The f core so for all x in f to the m f power of x is the plurality over all h in f to the m of p of f d, the line x plus p h at the point x. And the separation. And the proof outline which we had was if we wanted to show if we do one round of correction, the corrected function is actually closed. Okay, the proof sort of went in two parts. So we had these following we were going to observe two things. Claim one was delta f. F correction was at most two delta. So the corrected function was if the rejection probability was small, the corrected function is in fact close to the original function. And claim two, this is where we would need that for all epsilon in zero one, for all epsilon in zero one. There exists a C that if mod F is larger than C D and delta F is less than 1 by 8 minus epsilon. Then we are going to compare the delta of the corrected function versus the delta of the function. We will say that the delta of the corrected function. Then delta of f corrected will actually be less than delta of f by two. And we saw that once we have this, we have the we can we keep doing the correction successively. You take s, you correct it. When they take the corrected function, correct it. You take a sequence of functions at zero, f one, f two, and this list each time delta f was dropping by a factor half. These are only a discrete number of values that they can take. Therefore, eventually it will have to go to zero. So the corrected and notice if delta f is zero, then the function is the lifted free Solomon code word. Therefore, you do have. The final function in this list will be the Reed Solomon code word, and the total distance will be at most 4 delta. Each time it's going to be 2 delta f, 2 of delta f by 2, 2 of delta f by 4, so at most 4 delta. So this, these two will together. So claim, it should be clear that claim. Claim 1 and 2 imply the FS theory. So, so the PCP will now give you uh, access to small a and capital A, which is the basic fit for small a, right? 
Questions so far? More or less, all of this is recap of what happened last time. Hmm? And how do we claim two? This is where sort of the F, FS, this is a nice lemma due to FS, hope you will prove. Delta F is less than one by eight minus epsilon. Hmm. Then the probability is going to look at. So typically, how did we prove? How did we in the past? How did we prove some that the self-directed function was good? We usually showed that the most popular value is the overwhelming majority value, and for this we took up the collision probability. So we will do the same thing here. I'm going to ask the collision probability. I'm going to pick, but there we show the collision probability for a, every point. Here it's up, actually it's sufficient if I put the collision probability for a random point. So I'm going to pick a random x and two random lines through that x and ask what is the probability that t of f comma d at the point line x plus t h1 if you give it the line x plus t h1 is not equal to probability sorry not it's not equal to if i now give find out the best fit line best fit polynomial for the line corresponding to x plus t h2 by the way i have to be a little more formal when i say x plus t h1 x plus t h1 refers to the line then and it has forgotten the information that the point is x. It's one thing because otherwise, it, if it knew what the point was x, it's been queried, it could give a value such that f of it will give something which consistent. The line, when you query the lines or you have forgotten the point and the direction it's come from. You just give it the line value. It will tell you the name of the line. Because if you give it this, it's going to give you a function that. But isn't it evaluated at zero? Doesn't it like evaluated at zero returning? Yes. So the question is, how do you when you say the line? What I will give is not evaluate. So either you can give it a degree D polynomial, or I can just give it the Reed Solomon code word on that line. And you have you ask what's the Reed Solomon code word at this point x. Zero is just one parameterization of that line, looking at it in particular line as x plus x, x plus 1h, x plus 2h, and so on. We will just give it as a line, and for every point on the line, we'll, it will give out a value. That's what uh, the best fit polynomial will be doing. Uh, PFD will give you. It will give you a Reed Solomon code word. So, and that's why I wrote it in that language that 
what it gives you is a read Solomon code word, not a degree D polynomial. Basically, it's giving you the evaluation of the code word. It doesn't know it. You can set it up such way. You can, if you want to do it, you can now put you can do something else too. You can do it in this language, but I'm assuming that I'm giving it the speech and camouflaging the I'm giving it the identity of the line and not the identity of the point in the direction. So we could have just picked two random lines, right? The very high probability they will intersect. Oh, no, 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 no. This is that fan, they will not. So you so the way to do it will be to pick a line and another line intersecting. So you'll have to pick a point and two lines to it. And then you just give it the identity of the lines not the point line. So we ensure that this is less than or equal to four alpha delta f, where alpha is four by epsilon square size of this. I just say it is simply a denominator. Size of it is simply denominator. Yes, that's why the first person looking on that. So the advantage of this about the previous test here is that their delta was ordered one by d square their delta is constant. Delta is constant. Yeah, the, the advantage over the read Rubenfeld Susan is you have made the Rubenfeld Susan get we was able to tell you that this given function is close to low degree only if the rejection property is at most order one over d square. This one is saying even if the rejection property is constant, in fact, they say the constant is at most one by eight. The one by eight won't matter to us. I will just the fact it's a constant. So that even for a constant, the rejecting property is as large. Let me just transfer those in. It prevents the iPad from auto locking. Oh, auto locking. Yeah, so that's for oh, press the power button three times. Hmm? Press the button three times. Continuously. Auto locking and each time it's auto locking, it's throwing me out of them. Maybe you can turn off low power mode. Hmm? You can turn off low power mode. And the low power mode? Mm -hmm. Right. Where am I in the low power mode? That yellow. It is yellow color. So setting and back How do actually the, the last but one option back turn off? Okay. And what is here? The lemma will do the clean. Firstly, we will choose the field size large enough that's why this is delta f by two. You choose the field size large enough that this is delta f by two. And I want to claim once this is less than delta f by two, it implies that because what is the we saw this last time. Do you want me to redo this proof or I'll skip this proof? This is just the so let's just see. Let's just see. So I'm gonna just see that the lemma implies into and the lemma will be the most important thing for us from now on but lemma implies claim two if four alpha is less than one over half 
Why? What is delta F4? It's the problem. It's the probability that if I pick a random point in line and you look at F corrected at the point X and I choose the best correction for this one. pH at the point X, this is what this is. Hmm? Certainly, this is lesser than or equal to probability XH F corrected X equal to P F D X plus TH at the point X. That's the best fit lines oracle for F corrected. Some other line oracle is only going to have even a worse rejection probability. Hmm? Now, this has been defined to be the plurality of this quantity. Huh? Therefore, you are asking what's the probability that the most popular value is equal to a random value. Hmm? Certainly, that's lesser than the collision probability. This is lesser than or equal to probability x h and h prime p of f d x plus t h x is not equal to one minus it's greater than or equal to so this is so max max is uh, greater than or equal to for instance probability so uh -huh. one minus max is less than or equal to one minus yeah. yeah. And that's the that's the proof of, of the claim from the lamp. So this is all that we need to prove. So the rest of the lecture with the remaining 20 minutes or 25 minutes, we will go and go into the claim. So what's the claim saying? Let's go stare at the claim for a little longer. But that's the part of and the work cost for this, we will soon see, will be the Polish Spielman uh, access parallel test. This is all about non access parallel. It will beautifully bring the access parallel test into the picture. So, what is it once again stating? It is stating that if the test, if the lines point test does not pass the uh, accept very, very high probability, probability larger than seven eights, around seven eights, so the rejection probability is at most. One F minus epsilon, then the collision probability of the lines oracle with itself. Yeah, I'm just ignoring the points oracle. The lines oracle with itself is actually significantly smaller than the, than the rejection probability than the lines point. So there are two tests here. What we are doing there's one is the lines point test, that's the actual rotary test. Then there's the lines lines test, which is what is happening over here. You're picking a random point and two lines, you're checking the lines oracle against itself. You're stating that in the lines point test rejection probability is small, it's smaller than some fixed constant. Then the rejection probability of the lines lines test is smaller by a constant factor. The lines lines test performs significantly better than the lines point test. That's what is going on here. The lemma statement is the lemma states. If rejection probability of the lines point is less than 1 by 8 minus epsilon, then the rejection probability of the lines versus lines is significantly smaller, is 4 alpha times the rejection probability of the lines point. <coughs> This is just restating. Yeah. I'm just restating. Yeah. If I use this part of this is the theme which I will keep coming to in that part of this one. I'm just restating the lemma. The lemma statement is just that part. So how am I going to go into the robot? So the main 
work costs for the proof of lemma. is going to be the Polish experiment access parallel test. And what did what does that test here that recall the statement? statement went something like this for all epsilon in zero one. I'm saying you've got to say it slightly differently for this parameter. This isn't exactly this one. For all epsilon one, there exists a C greater than zero, so that if mod f is larger than C times D, this is to ensure that the F, that that's basically where this F is greater than C times D will come from the polychip scheme requirement. And And R i and C j are two families of degree D polynomials as i ranges in F uh, and and j ranges in F. So I so you have uh, for each for each i in F you have a row polynomial. For each column in F, for each J in F, you have a column polynomial, and you're given this with the guarantee that if you pick a random IJ in F cross F, R of I of J not equal to C of J of I. Actually, what I call row and what I call column are messed up. But, yeah. I'm not going to bother at this point of okay. If this is smaller than one fourth minus epsilon, then there exists a common explanation for the for both the row polynomial and the column polynomial. There exists a bivariate uh, polynomial Q of degree D of, of Exists of by the by variant polynomial Q of XY of individual degree D in either variable. Such that if I pick a random i, so actually the Polish Spielman has a it says that if you pick a random ij, the probability that the row polynomial at this, the column polynomial at this point, as well as the bivariate don't agree, is at most twice that error probability. And then it says if you pick a random row, what's the probability that the row is not equal to the restriction of q? You will only require the latter thing, you don't need the following. So the point, so what I need is to pick a random i probability that Ri as a polynomial is not equal to Q of i, the restriction of Q of i. This is at most one fourth, and probability of j that C j is not equal to this is at most one fourth. We might not have got the exact numbers one fourth. This one, if you look at carefully and Polish Spielman, those are these are numbers we'll get. If, if you don't, if you don't get one number one fourth, what you that would change the one eighth. But otherwise, constant. It's just moving from one constant to another constant. So this is the this is going to be other.
So it is, this is not guarantee to you a total degree poly Q polynomial. It's going to guarantee only an individual degree Q polynomial. But individual degree Q in each, which says that if the row polynomials and column polynomials mostly agree with each other in most places, then there exists a common explanation so that for most rows, the row polynomial is actually equal to the restriction of the bivariate polynomial on that row. And for most columns, the column polynomial is actually equivalent to the restriction of the column polynomial. We will use this to finally conclude the fatal so then. Okay. okay. Well, what we did, I'm not sure we got the exact constant one fourth, but the, the if you had one fourth, you're going to get one eighth in fatal so then if you had a different constant, it'll be a different constant. So don't worry about what the actual constants are. So the way we will view this, so the fatal so now let's plunge into the proof of the demo. So it would be nice to view the what so the, the function f is sitting on this space. There's the space f to the m. And the function f is giving sort of it's giving you a the function f is residing on this space. It's giving you a for every f point in this space, it's giving you a field element. Hmm? So this is eta. Now let's I'm going to draw a so I can't write out what this is the set of all lines. And F is residing on this space. F is from lines to read Solomon four books. And what we have is the lines point test basically F or in fact really what we can assume over here is F is in fact. We have assumed that this F is actually PFT. <coughs> now that's sitting in the space, and we know that if and there's a natural and there's a natural there's a natural bipartite graph of the point contain the line. We put an edge between these two, and what we know is most edges are accepting according to the low degree test. And based on this, we want to say that this object is actually and if every edge is accepting. We know that this is a lifted ring Solomon code word, and that's what we want to show. So we want to show the correct, the correct based on this F, we are going to come up with a <coughs> corrected function sitting here. And we want to say the corrected function is even closer, but then actually, if I this one, we just want to show the you know, what we, we come to the line after. Let me not what we, we have this. We have that the lines point test is passed up with good enough property. Because of that, we want to share the lines lines test. That is, take a line, pick a point in it, pick another line in it. That test passes with even higher probability. That is, the rejection probability falls by a factor four alpha, is all that we want to show. And when I mean lines here, it is basically pick a point and a direction. Pick a point and direction. This is not exactly the distribution of lines. The, there are some degenerate points added with certain extra of this one, but that's fine for us. That's what I mean by lines. And when I tell PFT on this, that's just going to give me one. And the proof of this is actually the proof of this is actually going to be go by a, it's going to add a third layer to this object. And these third layers are weird surfaces. On which the on which the code on which the polynomials Q is going to sort of live in. Hmm? Huh? What is when well, any point here will be specified by a triple x h1, sorry, a four, four tuple h4, sorry, h3. Then every point here is going to be specified by a four tuple x, h1, h2, h3. You could identify this, and what does it specify? It's going to specify a surface corresponding to this. What is the surface? So, so this is, so everything here is going to have a surface. For every x, h1, h2, h3, we will have a surface. And what is the surface? The surface f of x, h1. H two, 
H3 is going to be the set of all the points. This will be very similar to what happened in the Rubenfeld's Rubin test of I H1 plus J H2 plus I J H3 as I and J range over there. Notice this is not a plane. It's sort of a weird surface. Sort of as you range over uh, or the, it has few square points. And as we know, dot non-degeneracy happens. Regeneracy happens. This will have few square points on it based on the various ij. And for every x, h1, h2, h3, you're going to associate it. Once again, there might be the two different choices of x, h1, h2, h3 might give you the same surface, in which case we will identify them. But I don't think this proof really matters that we identify. We could label them with just like the lines actually. Question is whether you label the lines as X and H1 or the identify different lines. And the lines we actually wanted to identify. We wanted to the lines oracle not to know which point started off with the lines oracle. We did that. Here also you could do it, but the proof doesn't care for this. You could identify it. That will only help you further. So you're going to have that object. Fair enough. This is the object okay. This object will be an important object for us to keep in mind. And the reason we're going to be doing this is this object is this is not a plane. This is not a this is not a plane in the in the in the ambient space F to the M we are looking at. But if you characterize it by IJ, it is a plane. In the in the, in the parameterized world of IJ, this is a this is in fact it's it's not it, it, I'm just looking at IJ, I'm just looking at this grid, it's a grid in the IJ. Hmm? So grid and IJ, but I want to say this grid has several lines sitting inside it. What are these lines? So I'm going to call what are the lines? So given S, X, H1, H2, H3, if I give one such surface, then I want to look at the row and, and then I then look at pick I and a J both in F. And I want to say for corresponding to every i, there is a line in this space. And what is that line? Huh? For every i, there is a the line which I'm going to call rho i. And for every j, there will be a line called column j. And what's this line? This line is basically going to be this object. It's going to be the line x i h1 plus j times h2 plus i h3 as j ranges over f and column j is going to be x plus j h2 plus i h1 plus j h3 as i ranges in f. Notice that rho i the S X H1 H2 H3 is not a plane in this, in this one bit, but rho i is an honest to God line. It is a line. And the line passing through the point X i plus H1 and this direction given by H2 plus I H3. Similarly, column J is the, this one. So, and what we will now draw is we will draw these sort of things. Corresponding to these, we will Call these as the row polynomials associated with it, these as the and there's a bunch of column polynomials. These are the so given any of these surface, we are going to have a bunch of row polynomials corresponding to the various i's. We're going to have column polynomials corresponding to the various j's. I'm sorry, so, uh, so what we expect here, there is a bivariate polynomial in i and j. So what I want to show is for most, for a, what we will eventually show is for a random surface, hmm, for a random surface, this set of rows and columns, notice that they intersect, the rows and columns intersect. Hmm, we will show that there is set of rows and columns. This actually is a specific instance for a, a random x h1 h2 h3. Now, if you just look at it in terms of ij, this is an instance of the polyshift lemma, polyshift Kilman lemma statement. 
So you have a bunch of row polynomials, a bunch of column polynomials over here. So but you have a bunch of rows and columns. What is the corresponding polynomials for that? It's going to be so the, this is a line. What's the polynomial? Obviously, I'm going to choose what the uh, the you for every line we had a polynomial given in the by the middle row, by the middle part partition there, middle part. That will be the corresponding polynomial over there. Those will be the row polynomials and they will be the column polynomials. And what we want to show is that like, what we show is for a random choice of x, h1, h2, h3, these corresponding row polynomials and column polynomials will agree with each other quite well. And then because of that, you can invoke the polish Spielman on this particular purpose. You get a quadratic polynomial, a bivariate or not a quadratic, a bivariate polynomial. And from that, we will say that a, part, a particular row polynomial and a particular column polynomial agree with each other well enough. Okay. In particular, which polynomial we will we will want to show to recall the statement. Think of what's the lemma which we want to prove. That's the lemma which we want to prove. We want to prove for a random choice of x, a random choice of h1, h2. We want to show that this line at the point x and this line at the point x agree. Hmm? And we're going to think of, and I want to say those two lines actually, those two lines actually occur in this. What is those two lines? We want to, and, and for every line, for every line, so I'm going to give them So, but I'm going to obviously I'm going to give the line. I'm going to give R i to be the polynomial which is P of F d on rho i and C j to be to be what to be P of F d in column j. That's the response I'm going to give. And what is it that you want to show? You're going to show what what do we want to be for? We want to prove that for a random choice of x, h1, h2, let's throw in h3 also over here. That doesn't matter, is independent. We wanted to show the line given by x and h1. Uh, x and h1. What is that line over here? It's just huh? C0. It is C0. Hmm? So C0 at the point 0 is equal to R0 at the point 0. This is what we want to show. We want to show in this in this language is less than or equal to or alpha delta f. That's what we want to show. But polynomial uh, yeah. is being simply say deleted for most rows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not exactly polynomial. Screenment is come to so you need to show a particular this row polynomial, this column polynomial agree at this point at the all zero point. Polynomial screenment will say something very general. It will say that the row polynomial mostly agree with the quadratic polynomial. So, but this is the statement we want to. And the statement actually did not involve H3, but when I write it this way, I need the I need H3 because I have to invoke H3 over here, but this is exactly what we want. Fair enough. Now let's see. First thing we want to ask is can we invoke polish Gilman on this surface? Polish Gilman says that the row polynomial and column polynomial that agree most of the time, then there's a bio. Let's see on this surface, is it clear that the row polynomial and the column polynomial are agree? But this is after that, even if that happens, that's not enough to conclude if polish experiment happen to conclude that this, the row polynomial at the point zero is equal to the column polynomial at the point zero. That's further this one. So let's list a bunch of bad events which prevent this from happening, and then let's bound the probability of those bad events. Hmm? So what So what there are two things you must want. Polish experiment to the hypothesis for polish experiment to fail. And then given that now, okay, so we will set some bad events for the hypothesis for so that if those bad events don't happen, 
hypothesis for polishing Spielman holds, and therefore you have a bivariate. Now, even after you have the bivariate, there is no reason that you know that the bivariate will tell you that for most lines the row polynomial is uh, uh, agrees with the row, uh, the, the restriction of the, the bivariate polynomial agrees with the row polynomials. For most columns, the restriction of bivariate agrees with the column polynomials. That is not this. So we put some more bad events to ensure that from that conclusion of the policy payment will not imply this. And hence we will put. So let's list out a bunch of bad events. So, so consider the following. So this this you want not equal to that. Yeah, sorry. Hmm? Okay. Actually, E one is a probability. That if I pick a random x, h1, all the events will be on the probability of the choice of which surface I'm taking in. On which surface, the third part, the statement happens. The probability that the expected value of delta rho i, when i is big. So delta rho i is what? Delta rho i is the Every rho i, there's a corresponding polynomial, and it's the agreement with the expected distance of that uh, polynomial from this. We want to say that this is greater than 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2. So, so uh, what I mean is okay, this is the event. We follow what this event is. Once I focus on this surface, there's a bunch of rho i's, and I'm asking what's the expected value of delta of these rho i's to be large. Delta of rho i is the distance of notice for every that notice that rho i, if I pick a random surface and a random i in it, this rho i is a random line globally. Therefore, expected value of delta rho i globally. If I if I had taken this over expectation over x h1 h2 h3, mm -hmm. then this is certainly equal to delta f. That's the this one. So this is, is it a random one for a random let's say this for a random choice of x h1 h2 h3. That's the randomness. That's the randomness over here. And then the event the randomness is coming from the choice of the surface. And then I'm asking in that surface. So if I pick delta y completely over a random surface, random this one, this expectation is smaller than one by eight minus epsilon. I'm asking what's the probability it goes larger than one by eight minus epsilon by two. You expect this to be a low probability event. We'll have the same thing for the columns. Is this still going to be Marco? Let's see whether you want to do Marco or so Marco will certainly give us something. But you'll do better than Marco. There is no concentration. Yeah. In fact, all the inequalities will just fall from the same concentration inequality. It is the same thing for the rows, for the columns. E3 is going to be the event that the expected number of i's in F. And let's do one more definition. I'm going to define Mij to be basically f of x plus ih1 plus jh2 plus ijh3. It's what the points oracle is going to give at the point plus point ij in this surface. So your peaks 
Each one is two is three. Yeah, yeah. So this one, the following four events are for when I give the definition of row i column j, all of them I'm fixing a particular x h one h two going into a surface, and within that surface I'm going to to invoke polish element and do something. So all of this is within all of this is for a random choice of x one h two h, and there will be some bad x one h two h three which we are going to discard. So e three is going to be the the expectation over i that this happens. That is the probability of the probability over the i is that r i at the location 0 is not equal to m i 0 is greater than or equal to 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2. It's just probability. That is the ith row at the point 0 is not equal to m i 0. So this particular line point Notice this is exactly a line point. So if I take a random choice over h1, h2, h3, this is exactly a random line point. Uh, m i zero would you have total dimension of m i zero is just m i j is just the points oracle at the point corresponding to i j. So and i zero is taking the opinion from the line line passing through this. So this is exactly the line point that. Yeah. If I average over x, h1, h2, h3, this is the ninth point test, which we know is at most 1 by 8 and the other So the first two are the first, everything is actually the ninth point, the various versions of the ninth point test going on. And the same thing for the columns. Okay. Now we'll do two things. First, we have analyzed, we have to first show that the probability of E1, E2, E3, E4 happening, any one of them happening is small. And that will actually be for, for alpha delta F, what we'll show. Then we will show that if E1, E2, E3, E4 don't happen, if these bad events don't happen, then actually the hypothesis for policy lemma is satisfied. And furthermore, from that hypothesis, we can conclude that R0 and C0 at the point 0, 0 agree with each other, which will complete our Therefore, so firstly, we have to show, we will show two things. It will suffice to show the following. So, are you going to do a union bond for it? Yeah, we will just do a union bond. But then Markov will be sufficient. No, 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 you have a union bond over the four events. And then, but for each event, we will. So, suffice us to let me write down. Suffice us to show the following. There is some concentration. We will show A. We will show for. For K, probability of EK is at most alpha delta F. K is 1, 2, 3, 4. That is each event happens with probability at most alpha delta s or less than or equal to and b not e1 and not e2 and not e3 and sorry and So, uh, to conclude that the hypothesis of polyphilism is satisfied, you only need not even and not even. Yeah. And then you use. And from that, to actually, uh, that will only tell you something about how good the one row column is the quadratic. You, from that, you want to say the one quadratic, the row column is the zero one, and the column yeah. column is zero or three. You need some more for that. I will need E3 and E4. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Let's keep A aside. B will be in proof B. Hmm. A is where the special choice of the surface is going to come to your role. We'll do that. That's actually that will most of the cleverness of it then goes into A. So let's do the easy part first and then get to the. So we need to prove these two. So 
So just not E1 and not E2. If both these happen, what I want to say, what does that mean? That means if I pick a random I, I want to say not E1 and not E2 happen. So for recall what E1 and E2 are. I want to say not E1 and not E2 imply that if I pick a random IJ, Ri at j not equal to cj at i is less than or equal to 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2 plus 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2, which is equal to 1 fourth minus epsilon. Why is that? That should be obvious from. So Rij will actually be play for a minus j. Rij will evaluate a of a minus j. Yes. Singular for c j. Yeah. So they agree the union bound before you get this. You go via M to do, do this. So you have this. Therefore, that, that means the hypothesis for PS is satisfied. That is, hence, hence the PS hypothesis is true. Therefore, there exists. A bivariate polynomial Qij of individual degree at most d such that probability Qi dot not equal to Ri for random choice of i is at most one fourth and similarly and similarly for the follows. Fair enough. Now this, what does not E3 imply? Not E3 implies that, well, let's go to E3 again. What is E3 stating? E3 is stating that is take the height row polynomial. What's the probability that it does? And you're looking at the you're looking at various heights rows polynomial, and you're asking what's the probability that on the first point in the height row polynomial, there's a zero at point, there's points among the first column. Hmm? So you're looking at various heights, various rows. But you're looking at all points in the first column. What the point is the row polynomial agrees with the point oracle at least? Huh? So it mostly agrees with it, this one. But also, you know that the row, the height of the polynomial is actually the, the is a description of a bivariate row polynomial. Therefore, but for so I want to say. Over a union bound over this one fourth, this bad event, and that and E4. So you now know because E2 and E1, E1 and E2 have not happened. You know that for a good three-fourth values of the this one, the, if you pick a random I, you are going to fall in a, this one in which the I throw polynomial is actually the restriction of QH. But now among them, there's a further chance that. The i row polynomial and the first column is not equal to mi0. Therefore, for a random choice of, so I want to say, if this doesn't happen for a probability, for a random choice of i and f, r i0 is not equal to qi0 
is not equal to mi0 happens with probability at most one fourth plus one one eight minus epsilon by two. So when you see me at least one of these inequalities we probably do one minus this or this one. Yeah, so what I should write is actually that if I do the other thing so that equals this, equals this. Is greater than or equal to three fourth minus one eight minus epsilon by two. Is that fair enough? Therefore, you have this fact that R i zero is actually equal to Q i zero on a large fraction of points along this column. But these are two both low degree polynomials. Therefore, they have to be. Therefore, all, all I claim is this low degree for Q i this uh, Mm -hmm. Hence, C, C0 should hence identically equal to Q column Z. Because so I did C. I'm talking about the, these are row polynomials. So I'm getting, so I'm getting, I'm telling that these are, so. These are all right zeros. <coughs> hmm? Yes. Where does C come from? So from here, can you say simply this that the function i going to r i zero is low degree. So by the degree one to r i zero is identically no, no, no. R, r i zero is identically that quality r. Then we know it's not a Yeah. You're saying that r i zero. All the as you as i varies, mm -hmm. you're really varying in the zero column. Yes. So that it's really a statement about agree agreement on a column. Yeah. So in fact, I'm talking about the agreement on the column. So the picture is what the picture going on here. This is a x equal to rows are so a good fraction of so i's are varying this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at just the zero at column. Mm -hmm. So for a large fraction of these. The ri zeros over here are all equal to qi zero are all equal to mi zero. Once again, why does that tell you? Hence, I want to say any is equal to mi zero. Huh? You don't really need mi zero, right? You just need no, no, I need mi zero because for so what is happening over here? So look at look at this column now here. You know that. For the three fourth, a large fraction of this, you know the points table, and the points table agrees with this low degree polynomial, which is Q dot zero. And what is C zero? C zero is the best fit polynomial for that. Therefore, it has to be this particular polynomial. So, how did C zero? So, for a large fraction of points on this, yes. huh? You know that the mi zeros. So, let's look at it. for this fraction of the, points. What does the policy? Polychic Friedman has gone away. Well, we have a Q now in our hand. Polychic Friedman, right. I'm only going to use to. I'm only going to use this fact of Polychic. Right, right, right. So on one third, on at least three fourth rows, hmm. uh, the Q agrees with those rows. So all I'm going to use over here from Polychic Friedman, I have is for these rows, mi, mi zero is equal to Q i zero because of this. Because so right. I know on these points mi zero equals q i zero. So for a large fraction of points in the first column, it's equal to this low degree polynomial. Mm -hmm. But what is c zero? C zero is the best fit, and this is the polynomial that agrees. So that the c zero function has to be this polynomial. It cannot be any other. Hence, for all these, for all these, these are the i. The number of such i's are the rather the x is greater than or equal to three fourth minus one eight. Minus epsilon by two size of f. For all of those lines, we have mi zero equals to zero. That is, hmm? polychic Friedman. I use the conventional the first two. Then I use so this should actually have been written this way. So the way I should have been written this way, polychic Friedman will let me conclude ri zero is equal to q of i comma zero. Mm -hmm. That comes from, in fact, there I have actually Ri as a polynomial is fully, but I only go to repeat. 
then E3 will tell me this RI0 is mostly MI0. Mm -hmm. So I'm using RI0 to connect MI0 and QI0 because of not even not even not E2, not E3. And right. because of that, for all these eyes, I have MI0 equals QI0. These are all points around column zero. And so in column zero, the point circle is agreeing with some low degree for one most of the time. Therefore, the low degree, and what is C0? C0 is the best fit polynomial for that. Therefore, C0 has to be QI0. So what do we need for this? We need D to be less than something. Yeah, yeah, so we need it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've hidden that in the way I have stated the lemma statement that is. Mm -hmm. That S has to be larger than some C times D. So, um, why can't so in your picture, mm -hmm. why can't it happen that if you look at the first column? First column, go ahead. So you are removing that one at minus epsilon over two event, right? Yeah. In order to get equality with mi zero. Mm -hmm. What if the first column they are all bad in the sense that when you when you have this expected delta rho i is one eight, right? So so the event even in that expected delta rho i mm -hmm. is one eight. So or one eight fraction of the points in overall rho i's they are bad. Yes. Right. What if all those points are first column? So E3, E3, I think, rules that. E3 rules that though. E3 is precisely like when you the restriction of M on the other section. No, E3 says that, um, I see. E3 is exactly what I see. Exactly. Okay. E3 says that on three fourth, uh, on three fourth many rows. So you um, the row column that you say that? The M gives. I see. Okay. Okay. Okay, E three is ruling that out. Oh. Yeah, that's now we are basically done now. An identical thing for this one, not E four. Similarly, not similarly, not E four will imply. Similarly, not E four with not E one and not E two. Implies that R zero is identically equal to and hence. The, so all of these things are equal to Q zero. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And not E one and not E two and not E three and not E four implies R zero zero equals Q zero zero equals C zero. And that's the proposal. <laughs> Fair enough. Part one. That's the most clever part of this one, but that goes one simple observation. It's a concentration inequality. So we need to bound E1, E2, E3, E4. We need to bound them. And I'm going to say the same argument is going to work out. We know that each of these, if you have taken choice expectation over x, h1, h2, h3, this would have the expectation of the corresponding events would all have been delta f, delta f, delta f, delta f, which is at most 1 by 8 minus epsilon. Therefore, this is all some concentration inequality. Certainly, you can do Marco. Hmm? Marco, but what notice it? I want it, I want to show A. I want to get alpha delta f. Alpha is a number less than one. Marco will never give me this. Marco will give me delta f by some quantity that I want to. So I will need a constant bar a better. Marco is probably not going to be sufficient. You want to again count over four events. Four events. So Marco, so so just is one okay. minus epsilon. Hey, yeah. So then they try. So this is what we've done. ALMS, they will choose delta epsilon to be something like square root delta f. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, they will be the ALMS. This is how the proof is done in the original PCP theorem. Turn that way, so there are all cubic terms and all of them will come back. Here we are much cleaner in Friedel. So, the Friedel student basically they clean up this part and because they are going to get better concentration. Okay. Two for three. And we'll do just one of them, they will be similar. So notice that expected value of x, h1, h2, h3, expected value over i, delta rho i is exactly delta s. Hmm? But I want no more. Now let's look at the rows. Let's fix an x. Let's do the random x, h1, h2, h3. And let's pick two i1 and i2. Let's pick i1. Let's, let's fix i1, i2. So the observation I'm going to make now, the crucial observation the computer should then make is let's fix i1 and i2. And in fact, let's take two distinct i1, i2. Hmm. And let's look at what is rho i1 and, and, and random. So the first event is just the fact that this is like a uniform cover of this is a uniform cover of the whole thing. That is yeah. Random x h1 h2 h3. Good. Let's look at rho i1. What was this? This is x plus uniform variables plus i1 h1 plus j times h2 plus i1 h3 as j goes in f, right? And rho i2 is the same object. So fix i1 and i2, x, h1, h2, h3 are four random objects. I want to claim that this certainly this is a random line and the range over x, h1, h2, h3. I want to claim this is a uniformly independent row i1 and row i2 are basically two independent random lines. They are not even so the point they pass through observation is. Rho I1 and rho I2 are independent random lines. And the randomness is coming from the choice of four random x, h1, h2. So these two lines are not even the nothing is, and uh, I think the easiest way to see this will be just is it just let's look at each line point is defined by in, in fact I say it's even more general it's the point the point this row i is defined by it has several characterization but it can one way of describing it is describing the point the, the passes and the direction and I want to say x plus so this four tuple this four tuple x plus i h1, x plus i1 h1, x plus i2 h2, h2 plus i1 h3, h2 plus i2 h3. This four tuple are four, these are basically four independent, these are four independent points. If x h1 h2, that is, in the corresponding transformation matrix, it's yeah, the way the full rank matrix that is, is left to observe that this is exactly 
write that down in fact. It's x, h1, h2, h3. How do I? One one zero zero. One one zero zero. One I one zero zero. One I one. One I one. Zero zero. The next one is one zero I zero. One zero I zero zero. One zero I two zero zero. The next one is zero zero one I one. Zero zero one I one I one zero zero one I two. Every one of the is something is wrong with the data. The second vector there should be x plus I two H one. Mm -hmm. So, one, 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 the second column, one, I will And that's an invertible matrix if I1 is not equal to I2. There is an H case. Huh? There is an H case. There is what? If I1 equals to I2. Yeah, but the, the statement is for I1 not equal to I2. Huh? Yeah, so, so oh, but I want not equal to by fixing an I1 on I2, and I want to say this for uh, these four points, these four points, basically. Basically, that says these lines are uniformly random lines. Therefore, I can now apply Chevy. These, if I go over the line, I have Chevy Chevy. Means they're pairwise independent. And that's basically. Yeah, how, how do you avoid the variables? Huh? It's a zero. It's a so what do you mean zero one? Zero one period. So I'm just stating that hence hence delta rho i as i is an f are pairwise independent. Are pairwise independent. We know expected value of. Hence, the, prob the probability that the expected value of delta rho i is greater than or equal to 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2 is the probability of this over the random choice of x, h1, h2, h3 is strictly smaller than alpha delta f, 1 minus delta f, because of the, this one, which is less than alpha. That's so, I mean, do we do we need the uh, pairwise independence of the lines or was it enough? So you have row one root of the row q, mm -hmm. right? So row one has q points, row one has q one. If I just show you that any two points in this whole set of q square points, they are pairwise independent, that should have been enough. Mm -hmm. Because the globally f disagrees with for it might be enough. For... In the expectation, I mean you don't really care about right. I mean you just care about no, no, I, I do this no because what do I I am doing this. I am so sorry, I didn't follow this. So, so, do so, we, do so we, you don't follow what I have written here. So let's let me be a little more careful about what I have written here. So, what is the statement we want to prove? What's the statement we want to prove? We want to prove that quantity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh? What do we know? What do we know? That we know the expected. So let that quantity, let that for for x h1 h2 h3 hmm? let's call, call this mu of this quantity to be expectation over i delta rho i hmm? this but this i'm fixing x h1 h2 h3 over here this is this is for a particular choice of right That's how I want to do this. This is not how I want to do this. So, yeah, maybe the randomness is. Okay. 
So I am taking x h one h two h three and i. Then I know expected value of. So this is. So this. Oh, sorry. No, I am going to do this. So expected value over x h one h two h three and i delta rho i is delta i. We know this, which is less than hmm. one by eight minus epsilon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm asking what is the probability when I pick an x h1, h2, h3 that summation delta rho i over size of f, this is i in f, crosses 1 by 8 minus epsilon by 2. So I'm picking, I'm picking, I'm telling a random process of picking a bunch of highs, f different highs, and these are pairwise independent. The hence, this will at most delta times pairs alpha is four over epsilon square. Yeah. The four over epsilon is epsilon by two, and five the fact of the number of pairs. So, so this is exactly solution. This is exactly it. Do you need the one for alpha? Huh? Why do you need the one for alpha? So this is the way we sort of. I need to know what the deviation. The deviation is epsilon by two. That comes as four by epsilon square. Oh. The number of pairs I'm taking is size of x. That's the so this is exactly the which is less than that. Okay. Oh, uh, no, I mean, I, I was just wondering whether you need favorable independence of two different rows or. But I need it for the next, uh, yeah, next so one fully. Because you know, here you don't need it. I mean, instead of that delta y, you could have just written what is the probability that uh, a random point disagrees with that in this. And then you can just favorable that's not enough for so I do not know that the row and the line or col columns agree with each other. The row is dependent on the best fit to the points, the columns agree to the just, best just, just for this event. Just for this uh, computing this probability, do we know do you need to have independence of rows or have independence of two points? That's enough. So globally, globally, and disagrees with. Uh, you are saying I will choose these few square points, and then to have a dependence of few square yeah. points will suffice. They yeah, are suffices. No, it doesn't suffice because lines are playing a role in this. It's a line point test because all if it was fully if the test was fully specified by a point and done. The test is specified by the. It's a parameterized by a line also. It's the line agreeing with the point. Two points basically are not good enough for me. You're saying I have all these good points and the property, the number of good points I pick up. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I was thinking. So you have this F, F to the M, you call good point, there are seven or eight plus epsilon good points. And now in this surface, you are choosing two square points. But for the next but for the next one, yeah, probably you need. So at this point. And the similar thing happens for E2. Hmm? So, again, if you just want to just mark out directly, you could have gotten something like 1 by 100 instead of 1 by. No, Marco is an issue. I will not get the delta f is smaller than I need. Eventually, I'm going to make the property of the bad event be 4 alpha delta f, and I'm going to choose 4 alpha to be less than half. Marco will never give me that. Okay. I will never. Try. So, the delta is just to come in place. Somehow, delta has to come in picture. That's why the LMS is group is far more involved. Here, I'm able to show that the lines line test works significantly better than the lines point test. And I'm able to then complete the proof. The LMS has to do one more. So, if you recall the old proofs of BLR and Rubinfeld Susan, they had three parts. Firstly, you had to show that F is close to the corrected polynomial. You had to show uh, plurality implies overwhelming majority, and then you have to show that if this was the case, that the function is actually 
a linear function or a low degree function. Notice we skipped the third step. We are not doing the third step in it. Actually, we are not even showing that the plurality implies majority for all points. For all points. So this argument is cleverer than that. It kind of merges those two and gets it and shows that the plurality for an average point is better, but significantly better. And because of that, you are able to merge these two arguments into one single argument at function. That's what Fedor Sodan is buying. Previously, you had to do it in two parts. When you split it in two parts, the second one needed a far more uh, the, this overwhelming every point you needed plurality to be overwhelming majority, and that required put far more restrictions. And what Fedor Sodan observed is you can merge those last two conditions in the proof structure into one and get it. So in the LMS assessment, you don't get it in one shot, the loading report. No. Okay. no, 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 you get it in one shot. Oh, LMS is getting it in so one shot. So where is this boundary there? Huh? I mean, there should be some delta. And then ALMS is the, the, so the dependent on the field size and all is horrible. It's like CD cube and uh, the. But it is, delta is constant bounded away from one type. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. depends on the field size and the degree. Yes. Oh, you are saying that it's field size is large. Field size is large. So this is hence probability of E1. What we have shown is at most alpha delta F. Similarly, E2. I'll just talk about E3 and wrap up. We are already very, very, very much behind time. So E3 will be same here we see. Yeah, just we just have to observe. Let's look at E3. What was E3? E3 was probability that R i at the point zero is not equal to M i at the point zero. Mm -hmm. This is talking about a line point pair. Mm -hmm. Huh? It's the same exactly. This line point pair has a range over different this ones. These line point pairs are uh, completely Every line point, line point pair specified for one I1 and another I1 are uh, two completely disjoint, two independent choices of line points. Yeah. Huh? You wanted to show this is less than or the probability that this is greater than or equal to 1 8 minus epsilon. This probability is over i, and I want to show E3's probability is over x h1 h2 h2. Hmm? But it's the same exact same quantity. This is for a particular for a particular choice of i, you are focusing on a particular line or given by i and the point zero on that line. But for a different i, i prime, the different line and a point and the zero point. On it. This line, the line point pair, the first one, and the line point pair, and the second one, for the exact same reasons, are two independent line point pairs, and the exact same reason goes. If the argument is similar as above, as above, as for I one not equal to I two, this pair rho I one and the first point on that is rho I one at Zero this point and rho i2 and rho i2 the point zero these are independent are independent line point pairs. The same argument for all four, you get four alpha delta. It's a very clever proof, very sweet, very clever proof. So the reason they chose this surface is because of all the sampling properties, not because of all the excess value. You just needed somehow some used to points. No, no, but it, it's also the yeah. in IJ it is the the access parallel test of Polish experiment you are. Uh, no, but I like you said this is not a plane, right? It's just some surface. It's not a so, plane. It's a grid in IJ. Yeah, so as long as you have you are working with some grid where it has like two square points, you can inter 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 Yeah, so the point of this is not that the third the point of the third is if you do it in the picture, 
What we didn't do is not on the third day are planes. The third day has a very good sampling property of planes. Right. That is, if you just the third day has two sets of edges, the row edges and the column edges. The same with the row edges are a pairwise right. sampling of all the lines. The column edges are a pairwise edge sampling of all, and that's what you used. So, I think the same set of points that we have seen in the previous order, 1 by g squared test, when you expand the expression for g. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same. The same problem. Exactly the same. This, the surface was, was the moment. Mm -hmm. they didn't they put, pull it out of the hat. This was what was used in the Rubin for Susan, but for different reasons. It's a realization of Friedel Susan that the surface actually has good sample. They use the fact that they, they didn't use the fact it had good sampling properties. Here they realize that the surface has the fact. Extra pair by the dependent sampling properties. The surface and other yeah. I can't see how this paper would have. The restriction to the surface was analyzed in a no, no, but uh, they could have used here uh, Aurora Safra. Aurora Safra gave a bivariate thing with weaker part. It didn't give you one eighth, one fourth, it gave like one by hundred or one by thousand. The field was cubically. So dependent on the degree size, they could have invoked that. They could have invoked Aurora Safra. Mm -hmm. They could have invoked Aurora Safra and the Polish. Polish experiment gave a nice constant 1 by 4, 1 by 8, and so on. No, I meant the, the bivariate analysis in either via using Aurora Safra or via Polish experiment is significantly more involved argument yes. than what Google put given did. Yes, so, yes, yes. Which was the most. So, Basic natural thing that, yeah, right, 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 right. No, 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 they had the response to it. I'm talking about what, uh, so yeah. yeah, certainly you need the bivariate analysis. You need the to show the uh, plurality test, mm. the show the uh, collision probability. This you're now fo focusing on a, a line, two lines intersecting. So you're sort of looking at some object in a bivariate thing. So that was. You, need, you analyzed it using either polish. Previously, it was analyzed using Aurora Safra in the original TCP theorem. Today, so then use polish experiment, which came later. And furthermore, they observed that you could uh, polish uh, Aurora ALMSs used planes for this. Their sampling property was weaker. They realized because they had done Rubenfeld Sudan before that there's this other surface which actually, as a in the language of hydrogen expanded, is a better sampler. Is then the uh, points lines place the points lines this surface is actually a much better sample mm -hmm. than this one. That's the whole point of the okay. In short, let's wait for 15 minutes. Huh? Sure. Let's meet at 11 15. Let's pause now. Okay, so we proved the low degree test. The I'm going to show the low degree test in the previous part. Show that if the line point test passes with certain probability, it means that the points table should be close to a uh, honest to God low degree polynomial. Now, we saw that similar statements in the linearity world, once you're able to prove this, you are able to construct a PCP out of it. And the sort of the rate, the blow up of the PCP was basically. A function of the rate of the corresponding code, and in that case, it was the rate of the Hadamard code. Hence, it was exponential blow. You can ask the same thing over here. Can you construct a PCP from this low degree test and hope that the rate of the blow up in the proof will be related to the blow up of the underlying code here, which is the Reed Muller code or the Lefit column code, which has much better rate performance than the Hadamard code? Question is, can we construct codes which are can we construct PCPs in which the blow up is only polynomial? And that's going to be the focus. When we'll start off with this, it will not finish the proof of the PCP theorem. There'll be some leftover ingredients which we will then complete the, the next lecture. But so hopefully by the end of next lecture, I hope to be done with the proof of the PCP theorem. There is some alpha set approximations in the some alpha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's. So I'm not going. To, I'm not going to directly start off with trying to construct a PCP for this one. We will see sort of various reformulation and strengthenings of the low degree test. Come to it a particular form and then see that that form can be used for this one. So let's recap the low degree test. What does it have shown? 
shown the following. So f is some point stable. Show that if there exists a line stable, which is say such that probability f of x not equal to f of x plus b h at the point x. This is less than the delta. That implies there exists a there exists a global polynomial p in read Muller f in d such that delta f p less than 4 delta. There are some assumptions on it. I mean, it is sufficiently larger than the degree and delta is smaller than some constant. Okay, one, if the one eight, that's just make it even smaller. Than and this is that's such conditions. Not just this case, it's not exactly the sort of low degree test. The linearity is not similar to the linearity test. Linearity test didn't have two features. It didn't have it didn't have an additional table that it queried. Hmm? It queried only the already the given table. This might not seem like a bad idea for PCPs because PCPs are allowed to give proofs. So you could give the proofs the lines table also. Hmm? So in fact, the Original proofs of the PCP theorem actually did give the line stable as additional proofs. Hmm. What we'll see is we'll actually see it'll be easier for us to see an alternation in which in a formulation in which we don't look at the line stable at all. We only have the point stable. And I want to say there's something this test, no degree test, already tells about the following test. So let's change the test. Right now, the test is pick a random point and a random line. Query the point on the point stable, query the lines on the line stable, and check the there. But now let's do the what more like the Rubin Fred. The Rubin Fred should have recall there was no line stable. Just query d plus one point, ask if the restriction is what you would see. If you would see, accept it, otherwise reject it. Now let's do the same thing. Let's consider the following like the following alternate low degree test. That is, there is no lines of the over here. In which the input is F, FM to F, where of course I have a horrible axis. And the test is the following. What's the test? So it's the it's the it's the characterization of the Reed Muller test. Pick a random line, query the function on all. Pick a random line. Random line L. Query F on all points. And accept F respective to M belongs to the Solomon. This is what and what I want to say is the test that we have seen, the test that we can actually also analyzes this object. In fact, it gives a stronger statement. So, what would I like to say about this test? I would like to say, certainly the completeness for this is trivial. If F was a read Muller code or a left read Solomon code, it passes this test with probability one. I would want to say this test passes with if significant probability, a function is actually a low degree function. 
low degree is close to a low degree polynomial. But in the contra positive, if the function is far from low degree, I want to say the test fails with significant probability. The, there's a uh, there's a lower bound on the rejection probability of the test. So isn't this exactly the same algorithm where we got the of the order one Huh? Isn't this the same? There you query, you didn't query on all points of here, you query only on d plus two points. Hmm? The original Rubel Fetz Rubel Fetz Rubel had an, an additional test which they did this. We didn't analyze this in lecture, but Rubel Fetz Rubel actually had this test is from Rubel Fetz Rubel. What I want to say, let's look at so I so com completeness actually. Okay. Soundness, what we would like is the I would like to do the following statement. So let's call this NDT F. I'm just having this one. Probability. So let's write it this way. If delta F F with Reed Muller F M D is at least some delta, you want to say the probability that LDTF rejects is at least some omega. This is zero. That's the I predict the soundness in the contrapositive of the usual. So that is it. The test passes with significant probability once it is closed. I'm writing it the other way around. Okay. What I want to claim is what we have to do actually prove a stronger statement than what we want here. Mm -hmm. okay. A considerably stronger statement, and this will be useful later on. Possibly not today in the construction case, but certainly by okay. what I say, what we actually what the ninth point low degree test. Hmm? The lines point analysis. So the third step here is F restriction, restricted to L and then in the rates are Yeah, here it's more like it's close to rates on where the earlier step. Yeah, so that's because because of this, I want to say the lines point analysis actually gives even the following stronger statement, which is exactly what you said just now, is the following. Stronger statement. It says, and this should be obvious now once I write it down. It says if F D, then the expected value over a random X and H of F restricted to the line X plus D H. Delta is greater than equal to something. Huh? Here you see delta is greater than equal to I think it got frozen. So it's coming. Yeah. And RS and D. I want to claim this is what we have actually proven. Mm -hmm. Notice the like the, the let's actually why did we the following statement? If you look at that's why the contra positive of this. And I want to claim that the, suppose this is less than delta by four. That's exactly the statement of the uh, hypothesis for the low degree low test analysis we said. We said, listen from RSFD, if you take the best fit guy, find out the resistance. If it's on average close, mm -hmm. then you agree to this. So, this is, so it's actually not just stating that the test fails, that the, uh, 
you are not just it's not a one zero random variable you are now replacing so the so what we wanted here is you look at this one this can be viewed as expected value of whether of whether the this test rejects hmm? whereas this is the expected value of the distance of the local view from an accepting local view. So that was a zero one variable. It, it, uh, anything that was not zero, it was, uh, uh, was zero, everything else went to one. Here you're taking even a more grade, graded thing is actually true. So here you're stating this is the distance between the local view and a set of all accepting views. Even the stronger statement is sort of true. And that's exactly what the low degree test, the nine point analysis. So it's a, we have we proved not only the statement that the stronger statement which we wanted, but also the stronger statement. We have the statement. By the way, the statement is not just yields. I want to say the statement is equivalent to that statement. The statement which we proved, the statement in green is exactly the line point analysis, the statement of the line point low degree testing. If I have this, I have that. If I have that, I have this. These are these are just the same statement written in two different languages. So the bottom statement is stronger than the top statement. Not the top statement, I'm talking about the line point, oh, okay. the line point test and the green line. Certainly the bottom statement is stronger than the top statement. Mm -hmm. hmm? But I want to say that well, the green statement here is actually the and the line point and the and the statement here, which we proved in the first part of lecture, are the same here. Mm -hmm. They are the same here. Mm -hmm. They are identical. Mm -hmm. And the fine. Yeah. And I want to say this is a general phenomenon that's going to keep happening to us. That is, they will, they will so, and, and these two uh, tests, the PCPs are two different tests. One was just a two query test, query the point and a line, but in a huge alphabet. The line actually returned a humongous, it returned a B field elements combined together. The other was not, the other was not, a, uh, the other was not a, a uh, small query test. We queried actually few points on it. Huh? Few points on it. So you can convert any Q query test into a two query test in which you ask. So think of this as two provers. You can you ask a Q query test. I have a Q query test. I want to convert it to a two query test. How do you convert? One, one prover you ask, what is the uh, if I had queried these Q locations, what is the accepting view that you would have given me? And the other query, other prover, you just pick a random uh, uh, location among the Q and ask the other Q. Let's say exactly what it's doing. It's asking. It's just that if you would have seen this, if you have done multi prover interactive proofs in complexity, there's a statement in which you go from multi prover interactive proofs, K prover multi MIP to two prover MIP. And this is exactly the transmission. You take uh, you answer to all the k provers, ask one prover what is the answer. Of course, that prover is going to cheat because he can give the he will give a combination which will agree all the answers. But then to check that prover, you query it against another prover. And this transformation that's happening over here between the two is exactly that transformation. But what it is stating is in the two prover, if you do a statement about the two prover world, it is stronger than the statement that you require for soundness. It's actually a robust soundness statement. It doesn't just do the test case. It says that the expected distance of the test from accepting views is also low. So, so all I want to, we will make this more formal later, but this is not, I was just going to say this is not something that we will do in the next lecture, but this is something that has already appeared that this fact that is the two query, the soundness of the two query test. Is the same as the robust sound. This is what I will call in the following. This is what I will call robust soundness. Hmm? 
because it's not just the probability of the test phase, it's the probability of the is the expectation expected of agreement of the test with the expected difference of the local view with the accepting view. It says even that expected agreement is large, uh, large. expected difference is large. It's more a robust notion of the conclusion is with the sort of robust statement. And this transformation between two query or multi query PCPs to two query PCPs doesn't preserve soundness. Soundness for one thing is actually the robust soundness of another object. But then that is stronger. Right? Which is stronger? The robust soundness? No, robust soundness for the multi query PCP is the soundness for the two query PCP. So all I want to say is he's and this is some, this is actually syntactic. There's nothing going on here. It's just a syntactic statement saying that if you have a multi-query PCP, you can convert it to a two-query PCP. And soundness of the two-query PCP is exactly the robust soundness of the multi-query PCP. And this is there's absolutely no loss in the transformation. So are you saying suppose you have a robust, robustly sound multi-query PCP, mm -hmm. then one prover will give you an accepting fee. Yeah, and then the other two world will serve as the PCP for checking that fit is perfect. Yeah, so you can so one prover you ask if I had queried all of these two queries together, what and give you the and he and he why would he give anything other than accepting you? He could of course say with well, IG, but that's who is going to reduce the problem. He's going to give an accepting you. And the other prover you go and ask pick a random location in this thing. And this is know. exactly the robust soundness of the two query response. This is the same thing as the cross versus verifier. I don't know if you have seen this cross versus verifier test that happens. You ask one prover the entire class and the other prover a verifier. This is what is happening. And this is a feature that will come from this one. We will move between two query PCPs and uh, multi query PCPs and the transformation. And there is no loss in this transformation if we analyze this robust component of the multi query PCPs. There's absolutely no loss in the transformation. So, what is the two query PCP when the proof contains also the capital? So here, here the two query PCP is the PCP which also gives you the baseline fee for each x. The two query PCP one prover is one pr one part of the proof you query points, other part of the proof. In but case, once you query a line, the entire line, it tells me the Solomon or it tells me what is the univariate polynomial over there. That's the thing. And in general, this, the fact that this was random point doesn't matter. Suppose you had a Q-query PCP, I can convert it to two-query PCP in this format. One prover is going to just tell me for every possible choice of the Q-queries, what is a potential accepting view that the proof would have seen. The, and the second prover is just going to give the original uh, proof and you just cross-check this. So this is a transformation and this is the transformation which we have seen going from K prover MIPs to two prover MIP. And there usually it seems as a lossy transformation because we go between soundness and soundness. The point is you should not go between soundness and soundness. If you go between soundness and robust soundness, this is the same object just looked at from two different perspectives. That's all I'm getting. So we have the following robust soundness statement for the low degree. Right? So we will now now we won't have a line point oracle at all. We give us no since this request non-adaptive queries, right? Yeah. Or this have all of this is only because it's non-adaptive. I can't go this is adaptable. And nothing which we'll do in this course will be adaptive PCPs. But I only know one paper in the PCP literature, one or two which work with adaptive PCPs because the connection to hardness of approximation requires non-adaptivity. Yeah. So far, so good. Hmm. Next, what we will do? Yes. We will call something called the zero on subcube test. What's going to be the thing here? So I'm going to give you a function type. Okay. 
So we now we know how to check that this function is of degree low and of degree. The function is actually a reasonable code of degree t as long as the degree is sufficiently far away from q1. So we know how to do this. And now I suppose I want to check the this one to check the usual thing is distinguish. F. This is the low degree. F is the low degree for long here. T is the long term R and T. F belongs to R and Yeah, this is a low degree for long P. Okay. Uh, or, or just the right here. So I just write it. Yeah. Pronounced to honor. Yes, yeah. can be. That's the usual. All right. Later than some text. This is what we have now. But suppose further more, that's the usual, this is the usual low degree text. Right. But now suppose I want to check that let's want to talk about some sums of q, the like h is going to be some sums of f. I want to further distinguish the following. F belongs to Rm, F and D. Let's write it this way. Let's write let's define a new property called Z Z R M F and D H to be set of all F in R M F and D. So it's a set of all low degree polynomials. With the further restriction that f when restricted to h to the m is zero. So on this sub cube, it's a zero polynomial. So suppose I want to now distinguish given an f from fm to f. I want to distinguish that f belongs to This object can be H or F or the delta of F from any can we modify our test to handle this? So first say if you belong to the one or the H by C. How do you do Schwarz's book? Just sample some points from this and Will that work? So you are checking two different things. You are checking. So I agree. So, so yeah, I want to ask this question. So that's the intersection of two properties. One property is F is low degree. One property is F is uh, zero on H to the end. And there is a low degree test. There is a local test for the first property, there's a local test for the second property. Does that mean there's a local test for the intersection of the two properties? Let's check if both the tests. Huh? Let's check if both the tests. No, so to, let's do both the tests. Will that work? If it passes, it means it lies in both of these. So if it passes, you know that F is close to a low degree function. If the first test passes, the second test passes, you know F is close to a function that is zero on H to the M. But why does that mean f is close to a low degree function that is zero on the subcube? There might be two different functions. Why are those two? f is close to the subcube, f is close to a function p1, f is close to a function p2. Why are p1 and p2 the same object? So you the local tests don't work this way. If you can't, if you want to check uh, if the property is the intersection of two properties. You can't run the local test for property one, local test for property two, and automatically say that means if those two tests pass, it's actually close to the property that is property one intersection property two. So okay now, but now in 
I can uh, actually recover the P2 which F is close. Let's say if F is close to P1, mm -hmm. then I can actually recover P1 uh, right by a local sales product in positive. Yes. Then I will say take P1 restricted to H is still there. Yeah, so you could yeah, no, but that will not that, that will not check that we it could be the case that the polynomial okay. So what's the what's the test you are projecting? The test you're projecting is the following. First we draw the low degree test. Yeah, yeah. So the end of this you're, uh, you're convinced that the function ends is close to a low degree test. Now because it's close to a low degree test, we can draw the correction. And for every point you want, you will take a random thing, so the correction possibly will let's say that work that if you get this. And then, so what are you going to do? You're going to pick a random point in H to the M. Check it here. F could be a function that vanishes on all point, a uh, few points in H to the M. Mm -hmm. You will never be able to catch this. Okay, but okay, but if I have a low yeah, space so. for vanishing, then why? Well, if I have a low space, that given a low degree polynomial P, it checks uh, whether or not it vanishes on H in a low space. Mm -hmm. No, no, so it could be the case that there is a low degree polynomial. So think of H to the, think of H as not a large, H is not a large object, H is a small object. Huh? So suppose that H was that four by four cube, uh, it is a length four. The other things are all one. I'm claiming that there are five points in H. Uh, okay, if, if it was say, okay, that small you query on all the points in H to the one again, it could be the case that there is a low degree polynomial which is zero on all but one point on H to the M. Suppose the parameters were this. Mm -hmm. Your test will not work for this because then you have to basically locally correct every single point. What about taking a random linear, yeah, random linear combination of the points you make? Yeah, so the original proof basically, the, the original proof of the PCP theorem, this is what the sum check protocol did do. It sort of would keep doing its random linear combination inspired by the, this one. We will do a slightly different. So this is essentially what the thing you will do a random name it will keep going linear combination one after another. Then eventually we are done with this. So it will take random linear combination in a very structured fashion to do this. What we will do is uh, that I think I'm going to use the following observation. In P. The, whenever I say small f, I don't know if it is low degree or not. When I will use capital P, Qs, and all, it, it's a low degree polynomial. So I want to say P is a the P. P is an RM FD. Hmm? That, that's already given to us. <clears throat> now I want to say P is identically 0 and 0. P is a polynomial which uh, vanishes on this. If and only if there exist polynomials q1, q2, qm in Rm, md, actually there will be a smaller degree, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Such that. So what is h power? Hmm? What is h power? P is restricted to h. P is restricted to h. So P is a P is a low degree polynomial that vanishes on H power M. Oh, is a subset of Huh? Okay. H is a subset of it. H is a subset of it. So the things that are given to me are H. It's a subcube. I'm talking about the subcube. Mm -hmm. If and only if P as a polynomial is identically equal to QI X as a polynomial, I'm going from 1 to M times z h x i where z h of variable y is just product of y minus h h and h. Okay. This is combinatorial also. This is combinatorial also. Okay. 
agree with this? You want me to prove this or else? I'll take this for front page. Mm -hmm. You can also claim something about individual degree. I can claim, but I will need not need this. Commentary is a stronger statement, but not, this is all I will need for the. Certainly, one direction should be true. If, if this is the case, that should be the case because of this. The other one is also to just keep dividing one after another uh, each time. Divide, divide, think of it as the variable the first one, divide by the h1. Keep dividing. So finally, you come up with a after division, you come up with a small nominal whose individual degree in each variable is at most is strictly smaller than pi of h and it vanishes on the entire space. Therefore, it has to be the all zero small nominal, and that's what you get. So that's basically the proof of this. So now I claim, but this gives us a way of proving to me this. This will essentially be what we have told by the subject protocol to prove to you that p is low degree. What will I give? I'll give P, I'll give Q1, Q2, QM. I'll give all of these. So to prove P is low degree, and P is low degree and is zero on the sum sub Q. I will give P, Q1, Q2, QM, all of these tables together. You can run individual low degree tests on each one of them, they convince that they are all low degree. And now pick a random point and check that that identity is satisfied. Hmm? If that identity, either that identity is satisfied, Everywhere, or it's violated at a large fraction of points. That is assuming it is small. Huh? Because you need the right hand side to be low degree. I need the right hand side to be low degree. So, yeah. So, watch again. This will work when F is. So, for the test, I will need F to be of size larger than D plus size of H. It will be significantly larger than D and size of H. So the following is the PCP or the zero and sub Q problem. Input is here. Yeah. When our axis to this, we're also given our axis as proofs. We expect Q1, Q2, Qm, all of them being functions from F and to F. And The test basically does this. It's one, picks a random line. L checks F restricted to L, Q1 restricted to L, Q1 restricted to L, but all in R S F D. And now that you have queried it on this line, for all points in line L, check. F of X equals summation UA of X, ZH of X. You know, anyhow, query all those points, those are under points, and just going to do this. Next. Yeah. Certainly, the completeness is trivial for this. Soundness, I want to claim, I have the following soundness. In fact, we might eventually need a robust soundness also for this. But let's at least see the 
boundless version of it. So let's assume mod s significantly larger than some this order of both d and the size of h. Then I do want to claim that if delta f z r m Greater than some order omega delta plus d plus sign of h. So this second study could have varied on an arbitrary point I, I, I just don't want to like I've already varied those points. So suppose even if I check one point on it, it would have a place and put it on an arbitrary point. Later on, we will see when I want robust soundness, I'll actually have to query on the whole line. <clears throat> and if I want a robust, if I want a robust soundness of this one, we'll come back to this test. Actually, we will need robust soundness for all other objects. So when for that we will actually need, I would have had to query all the points because I won't get robust enough by query one point, you query the whole line, mm -hmm. and you will, uh, you will have a better short open and say things like that. So this should be, I'm not going to prove this, this should be trivial again. There's, there's nothing going on here, and this press zero on it. Questions point. Now, now say we are now more or less acute. To construct a, to take any NP complete problem, NP problem in NP, and construct a PCP for it using the read mother code. Now, next point. We construct PCPs for the three color problem using logic. Huh? So, what's the P color problem? Okay. Instances of the graph, an undirected graph, B, comma E, is an X instance if there exists a coloring P from B to 0, 1, 2. Such that for all u v in h c u is not equal to c u.
And if I can manage to show it for this, basically I'll be showing it for any entity because you just reduce the entity problem to three color and then I will do the construct of PCT. So the classical proof, MP proof is the coloring itself. You give this coloring, you can check it. But to check it, I need to go over the entire coloring because I do not know which edge will be where the violation is going to respond. I basically have to check every edge. I have to check that this coloring is. There's no way I can read, not read any edge. But I want to do is I want to give this proof. Instead of giving the coloring, I'll give sort of a PCP of the coloring so that I can look at it at very few locations and still be convinced. In the yes case, I should be convinced with probability one. In the no case, say that if I'm convinced with probability more than one, eight, possibly this is not a coloring, but there is the actual, it cannot be the case. Suppose I get satisfied with probability 99 over 100. Then this might not be an encoding of the coloring, but there exists a coloring because of which I'm passing with such high probability. That's what we want to do. We want to now somehow write a PCP which encodes within it the coloring so that this PCP and I a checking procedure so that this checking procedure has a property as following. I look at the PCP only at a very few location. And if the graph is in fact three colorable, every such test will pass. If the graph was not three colorable, then I will at least one a constant fraction of the local test that I do will actually have to fail, no matter which proof I give you. This is what I want to do. Hmm? So what we want to do is encode. The coloring using a PC. Right now, the problem is there are no underlying fields, nothing going on here, there's no polynomial city. We will now, what we do is arithmetize the whole problem. We will. What we'll do is even choose a field F and a dimension M in a subset S of F such that the following is so that roughly. S power M will identify with the vertices. That is, there will be some subcube of the field which will identify with the vertices of one. In number of vertices has to be a power of or just add some. add dummy vertices, add dummy vertices. This was a function from B cross B to 0, 1, 2. The edges was basically this was a function. That's your symmetric function, but that's thing. So what is the, the color is on the particles? Huh? Zero one, zero one, zero one. Sorry, sorry. The edges are. This is not the. This is not the colorings. This is just which edge exists, which edge doesn't exist in the graph. The edges are given by this object. I want to arithmetize this object. So what I want to do is I choose a low degree extension of it. What do I mean by this? I'll choose a function e hat 
going from Fm cross Fm. So what space is watching with them? Let's say Victoria, what's happening? You have the you have Fm sitting here. When there's the subcube. This, this is the whole thing is F to the N. This is S to the N sitting. What I know is the function E on S to the M. E is a function on S to the M cross S to the N. Cross. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So think of this as to the N. We'll be doing it both by hand, doing both of them. Let's put it to hand. The function is sitting here. There's a natural way to extend this function. So I will pick what's the function, the individual degree. So if I there exists a low degree extension, so that the degree in each variable, the degree of in each variable of e hat in each variable i is less than or equal to size of s. And e hat on s to the m is equal to. There's a natural, in fact, there's a unique low degree extension of this So what I will work with is the verifier by itself is going to convert the e which is given to it in this language. It's just going to e hat. This is something the verifier can do himself. And therefore, the total degree of e because of this, the degree of e hat is at most 2m size. Yes. The field will be chosen large enough so that this is a this is very small compared to the field size. Okay. This is something the verifier can do. Now, if this is happening for the edges, the same thing coloring was on the vertices. Okay. So let's assume zero, one, and two are elements in the field. One, well, you can do exactly the same thing. This is C hat. You are given uh, this is the following is basically this S to the M. So this is the low degree extension of in the exact same way. This is the low degree extension of the Of the colorings. Of course, this is not something I can compute the verifier can compute because the color verifier does not have the coloring. But what you would expect as proof is this C hat. We expect as proof the C hat. But we now need to check if the C hat is a valid. So what we will do? The expect as proof. That's what should we call it? I'm going to call it a violate my convention. I'm going to do C FM to F. And this is capital C, it's, it's purportedly the low degree. Of course, you can check that it is 
a low degree function easily. Just query it at a few locations from the low degree test, it can be queried. But that's not sufficient. I don't only consider suffice to expect the low degree function. I want to check it is the low degree and in uh, extension of a valid three color. Question is how do we do it? So how do we check this object? So it does then it's a recurring for that. I mean to check C minus one, C minus two, C minus three is in C What what does on is it only takes the value zero, one, and two? Firstly, you have to check. So what are the well, so what do we need to check? We need to check that's right on the step. We need to check. One that is for all. So the proof also can consist of e hat, right? Something like that. Yeah. So e hat you can compute it whenever you want. The extension is not this. How do you know this one? And you don't have. I don't care. So I will. You will say low degree extension is unique. If I just put a restriction that low degree, it's not unique. Low degree extension. Even if, if I put individual degree, it's unique. And this one, the verifier will just construct it in its mind and work with it. And what has access to records for the uniforms which he had in the But all access is not in the record of the brand. No, what the vehicle is not going to see. Yeah, but you, but you can define it uniquely. Yeah. CX belongs to 0, 1, 2. What is the condition for this? I want to check. I did check. C C minus one C minus two C zero. Yes. The C F X. So I define this polynomial. I define the polynomial the same. Let's call it F. Which is just C C minus zero C minus one C minus two. And I need to check the text restricted on. I don't know why I use this to the end. The same letter to the end. Decided to leave the. But if this is something I can do, you expect the low degree of this and then check. Of course, this tells you that what's being given to you is actually a three color. Doesn't still tell you it's a valid three color. Any three coloring I could have given and done this. That's that only the first test. This checks it is a three, it is a three coloring. Now I want to check it's a non monochromatic three coloring. I think I want to check this for all UB in. SM cross SM. We need to check that if the edge exists, it should be no. uh, not equal. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you need to, let's define this function G. G of G of G is going to be a function from SM cross SM. P of any x y is going to be e of x y Plus one minus two plus two. Yeah, I just put all the three. Plus two. You need to check this object is G restricted to SM cross SM. Okay. 
And this is all of this is something we can do. You're going to expect C hat. Hmm? So you're going to expect us through C hat. Hmm? Now, once you have C hat, you have F you don't have, but you will cook, you can pay, produce F at a random location by just querying C at the random location. So you want to check that F is a zero and sub Q. You, you'll expect us to prove some Q1, Q2, Q3 for that. And then run the zero and sub Q for F. Similarly, you now you have to do G. G, you will buy, you are going to you know, for access to X-ray, you make two queries. Okay? So you can simulate access to G using access to C. E you will construct yourself. So you have access to G. You have proofs for this. Run them. These will all be the proofs. That's going to be the entire. So the, that's going to be that's the end of story for. So what's going to be the proof? What's going to be the PCP proof? PCP proof is firstly CFM to F, which is the purported proof, purported loadingly extension of a valid, of a valid three coloring. I'm going to give Q1, Q2, Qn going from Fm to F. These are the additional polynomials to check that F on Sm is identically zero. Then I'm going to have P1, P2, P2m going from f to m cross f these are the polynomials required to check <coughs> that this g of s2m is identically zero and the verifier is going to be going to pick random line l l L and L in FM, the L prime L prime in F two to the end. So here you are making mod if is huh? Here you are making mod if. Squares, right? Yeah. But that is not constant, right? Because AC is like I'm not saying I'm through the piece with your own under the whole It could be the end of next section. Query. Query. C, Q1, Q2, QM on L. And accept each restriction of low degree and reject if any restriction is not low degree. Query P one P two P two M and prime and reject of any restriction as not low degree. For each Z and L, reject the Z minus one, Z minus two, Z 
is not equal to summation yz that s the prime and the L prime projects the E hat of the prime. The prime is the close legs. The prime one, the prime two. The prime looks like X prime Y prime. The whole is a bunch of C's that's not equal to summation EI of B. I guess. Right. This is a uh, this is the coefficient of the combinatorial yeah. transcendence that's for the second function. Yeah. But that this is not the same as that PI. Which is not okay. Well, PI is for coefficients of the common yeah. division. Oh, okay. so that's the entire thing. And the sauna should be clear from what we have done. It was put away large fields. You have this. It's so you're querying some n times size of cube points. Huh? So we will choose. This. So we will let's actually stop this one. What we will do in the next lecture. We will set M and S, but that this will be polylog. The we will we are constructing a proof in which the proof notice we will construct as that the sum of all these proofs together will only be polynomially larger than the original coloring. So the proof, unlike the Hallamard base, this one, this is the proof will new proof will be polynomial number. You will be making polylog queries, not constant queries. Yeah, these are optimizing over N. So yeah, I'm going to choose. I need, I still have F and M as I haven't yet chosen what field size, what M I will choose. We will choose them appropriately so that the proofs, the all sum of all the proof length together will be polynomial and the total number of queries, which is something like M times size of F, will be polynomial. So, so, what is determined by the fact that in the logarithmic test, you needed F to be greater than some constant times. Yeah. And then M, there will be some optimization over N. Yeah, I will, yeah, we have to choose it other the read muller and coding is only polynomially large. The read muller of the one extreme version of read muller is the other one encoding. Read muller ranges. So I have to choose an appropriate M, Q, and all of this. We'll do all of this thing next time. And you realize that you can never get it to be constant. You will get it to be polylog, and that will be the best you can do. If you want the blow up to be polynomial, the query complexity will be polylog. And then we'll ask, can we do better? So we had to. Because I don't want to take the need to open him to go elsewhere. We'll analyze this, we'll do the, the quantitative analysis. The PCP is exactly this. There's nothing more to the PCP. And it's a very given the zero and subcubit loading in test, the PCP is fairly straightforward. So what we'll do, we'll just analyze and show that this the Hanuman thing was a uh, used quadratically amount of randomness and constant query. This will use only logarithmically amount of randomness. But polylog queries. So we have two such PCPs. Question will be given both of these, can we get the best of both the words? And that's what we'll do in the next lecture. We'll combine them to actually finish the proof of the PCP. Yeah, this will be like some composition. It will be a composition. Yeah. So the heart of next lecture will be composition, PCP composition. So next lecture. First, we'll start off with a quantitative. Analysis of of OPCP. PCP. PCP composition. Thank you.